Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everyone. Before we move into the economy and specifically the housing sector, we need to briefly update the developing situation regarding the global response to China's opening up. As we anticipated in yesterday's video, the United States has joined Japan and a growing list of other countries in restricting travelers from China out of fear of a new COVID wave, including new variants. Yesterday, Wednesday, the U.S. CDC said that from the 5th of January, travelers boarding flights to the United States from mainland China, Hong Kong, and Macau would need a negative COVID-19 test or proof that they have recovered from a previous infection. The move coming just one day after Japan and a few hours after Italy announced similar measures. India, Malaysia, and Taiwan have also introduced testing restrictions on inbound PRC travelers. The U.S. requirements also apply to passengers arriving in the United States via a third country and those connecting to other destinations through the U.S. We remember on Monday evening, Beijing announced that it will be essentially opening its borders in early January after almost three years of strict quarantine restrictions. On Wednesday, yesterday, China's civil aviation regulator confirmed that it will terminate all pandemic restrictions on international flights as of the 8th of January. However, as we all know China is currently experiencing a massive first wave of cases due to its sudden U-turn from zero COVID, with an estimated several hundred million infections nationwide in December. As such, it is the concern of health officials from other countries, still with fresh memories from January 2020, that such a large outbreak and arguably suboptimal surveillance presents a real risk of a new dangerous variant emerging. The U.S. CDC said in a statement that the New restrictions will slow the spread of the virus, and is being implemented due to quote the lack of adequate and transparent epidemiological and viral gene sequence data being reported from China. End quote. As we just said, Italy has also rolled out similar restrictions. On Wednesday, Italy's health minister expressed that Rome's measures were quote essential to ensure surveillance and detection of possible variants of the virus in order to protect the Italian population. End quote. Adding that his office had already written to the European Commission to request EU measures, there have already been calls from other EU countries to impose restrictions too. Members of Germany's opposition, Christian Democrats, went so far as to call for a suspension of all flights from China to Germany. The German Health Ministry has stated, however, quote, "So far, we have no indication that a more dangerous mutation is emerging from this outbreak." End quote. On Wednesday, the UK Health Ministry said it was not considering restrictions on travelers arriving from China. We remember that Italy was the first Western country to experience devastating outbreaks of what, at the time, was referred to as the Wuhan pneumonia and later called COVID-19 at the start of the pandemic. Italy is desperate to avoid a repeat of March 2020. Rome health authorities said yesterday that at least two flights coming from China in recent days have had up to 50 percent of the passengers test positive for COVID. On Wednesday, yesterday, PRC Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin accused Western countries and media of quote hyping up and distorting China's COVID policy adjustments. End quote. Adding that countries' policies should be quote science-based and proportionate and should not affect Normal people-to-people -people exchange. End quote. People living in China would perhaps point out that these new restrictions in Japan, Italy, the U.S., and other places are very mild compared to the measures which Beijing itself has imposed on inbound travelers into China for almost three years now. Okay, one more quick thing while we're on this theme before we move on to the housing sector. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region has announced that it's removing the territory's final major COVID rules, according to Chief Executive John Lee at a Wednesday press conference. Starting today, Thursday, there will be no cap on the number of people who can gather in public, and the vaccine pass for entry to venues will also be dropped. Close contacts of COVID positive people won't need to be quarantined. And limits on the number of people who can sit together in restaurants and bars will be lifted. Also, Hong Kong will no longer require inbound travelers to take two COVID tests after arrival. Okay, next up, China's housing crisis.
Hey guys, if you're enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. For regular viewers, it may be worth checking that you have not been unsubscribed from the channel. This has been a common issue recently. And for the 50% of viewers who are not subscribed, if you do like the channel and you'd like to support the channel, uh, subscribing and hitting that bell notification not only means you get these updates once they're released, but it also helps the channel itself. And as always, those who can go that extra mile and help me keep the channel primarily subscriber, community supported, and not have to rely on corporate sponsorship, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much everybody for all the support. Okay, let's continue with several important developments in China's troubled housing sector. These last several months, we have been distracted by lockdowns and zero COVID, and now with reopening and the massive COVID wave spreading across the country. However, the housing crisis which has mutated in recent months, continues to be a serious, deep systemic challenge for the Chinese economy as we move into 2023. Just as the global financial crisis developed over the course of two years, with longer lasting fallout, China's housing crisis is slow moving, and policymakers still have the tools to kick the painful structural reforms needed down the road a few more years. As such, we must continue to follow the housing sector closely with periodic updates. So this housing crisis has always been there, but it now returns to our focus. Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin reports yesterday that more than 20 Chinese developers have disclosed plans to sell new shares since China's securities regulator lifted a 12-year ban on developers' equity financing for the ailing industry last month. The outlet writes that China had largely shut developers out of the stock market since 2010. Quote, as policymakers sought to prevent real estate enterprises from amassing cash for aggressive land purchases. End quote. The lifting of the ban on equity offerings by developers will allow real estate companies to raise money on the Chinese mainland and Hong Kong stock markets by selling shares through private placements for specific purposes, such as debt, repayment and acquisitions, according to the outlet. Quote, the policy is part of the so-called Three Arrows program, along with supports to developers' bank borrowing and bond sales to bail out the property market from a year-long liquidity crisis. It will take time for the companies to benefit from the reopened financing channel because of the current market environment and weak investor confidence. End quote. Meanwhile this week, Dongguan, population 10 million of South China's dynamic Guangdong province, announced the abolition of tight restrictions on who can buy properties and how many they can purchase. The removal of measures designed to reduce systemic risk and curb speculation in a major wealthy city is yet another sign of how desperate some local governments are getting to restore sluggish market confidence. China's housing market suffers a protracted sales slump, hurting economic growth, local fiscal revenue through reduced land use sales, and financial systemic health generally. And of course, the downturn in sales has made it impossible for many over-leveraged property developers to service their debt, even now that Beijing has reversed its deleveraging campaign against the sector. The China Real Estate Information Corp estimates that China's new home sales this year will likely drop 24%, 1.36 billion square meters. According to China Real Estate Information Corp, nearly 300 cities have eased policies to boost housing demand so far this year. However, the majority of those have been in small cities in poorer regions, with large cities, especially in first-tier cities, Beijing, Shanghai, etc., previously just slightly loosening home buying restrictions. The loosening seen in Dongguan and also recently for Shan, also in Guangdong province, are notable. One industry expert speaking to Chinese financial media outlet Yitai expressed to the outlet, quote, for Shan and Dongguan are both cities with GDPs of more than 1 trillion yuan, 143.3 billion US dollars. The signal of their completely abolishing purchase restrictions is significant. End quote. The outlet writes that in Foshan, after the relaxed policy was issued on the 8th of December, the average daily sales of residential properties rose to 211 units, an increase of 45% from the previous week. However, this number was still disappointing for local policymakers. Still almost half the average of 388 daily units sold in December 2020 and 344 units sold in December 2021. And of course, this is no surprise. Years of zero COVID has hurt household incomes, and a year of housing crisis has damaged household confidence. 
The result is a poor demand-side situation for the housing market. New survey data published this week by the People's Bank of China, China's central bank, showcases this well. According to the latest report, which polled 20,000 urban residents between October and December on property buying intentions, the number of Chinese people intending to buy homes in the next three months has dropped to a six-year low, with the top reason being that more households believe prices will fall than think they will rise. Some 18.5% of people surveyed expect home prices to drop in the next three months, up from 16.3%, while 14% expect them to rise, down from 14.8%. 53.7% expect no price change, which, in a speculative market, means very cool demand. 16% said they intend to buy a new home in the first quarter of next year, down from 17.1% in Q3. Those households expressing a willingness to invest more generally was 15.5%, down from 19.2% in Q3. And of course, and this is the last thing we'll touch on for today, the sluggish demand for the property sector has been catastrophic for many input industries which developed to support housing during the boom years. For example, before the housing crisis, nearly one-third of steel demand came from investment in new construction of homes. In the first 11 months of this year, property developers' investment in new construction in China dropped 9.8% year-on-year. As we saw yesterday with new National Bureau of Statistics data, profits at China's iron and steel manufacturers collapsed an incredible 94.5% in the first 11 months of 2022 year-on-year. For ferrous metals smelting and pressing firms, combined operating revenue totaled 8 trillion yuan during the period, down 9.8%. Profitability has also been hit hard by the rising costs of fossil fuels, with recent China Steel Development Research Institute data showing double-digit fuel inflation rates for the steel manufacturing industry in China. Massive debt financed government stimulus spending on infrastructure has likely saved large parts of the steel industry from being wiped out. The infrastructure construction sector accounts for about 20% of Chinese steel demand. Analysts with Tsai Xin, speaking with experts at the China Iron and Steel Association, write that the industry is entering its sixth downward cycle since the 1990s. Quote, with its member companies seeing their combined profit in the first three quarters nosedive 71.3%. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Wherever you are, I hope you have a great day, and I will see you all tomorrow.